turn in your New Testament scriptures, Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll read verses 1 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, familiar words, but may this chapter again encourage you. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he hath loved us, even when we were dead and trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. You may be seated. Our subject this morning, following the basic outline of the Westminster Confession of Faith, is the subject of good works. The subject of good works. What's so important that the confession that we indeed ourselves think about the subject of good works. We would say that's natural for the Christian. Every Christian should focus on good works. Well, as you know, this subject is at the heart of some of the most important debates of the Reformation. For in the Reformation, not only was it necessary to seek to recover the truth about election, the truth about justification and other very central topics, but it was very important to recover the truth about good works. Because as you know, there is so much false theology and practice related to the subject of good works. For example, the Baltimore Catechism of the Roman Church speaks of the superabundant satisfaction of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of the saints. And they define this superabundant satisfaction as that which they gained during their lifetime but did not need. They did so many good works, they didn't even need all of their good works. And amazingly, the church applies these good works to fellow members of the communion of the saints. Can you imagine how steeped in false understanding was the church at the time of the Reformation and is still steeped in some of these false ideas today. As G.I. Williamson reminds us, the marvel is not that the good works of believers are so great. If we're focusing on the greatness of our works, we're totally missing it. No, it's rather this, that good works of believers are accepted and rewarded at all. That is the focus. Why? Well, Isaiah 64, 6 says, our own righteousness can only be compared to what? Filthy, disgusting rags. That's our righteousness. And so we know that even our very best works are what? Our very best can be defiled and mixed with much weakness, imperfection. And so we ask this question, how can we speak of good works at all? Again, the standard is not man. The standard is a holy and righteous God. So again, how can we speak of good works at all when we speak of the absolute perfection of God's law and his very nature? 
Now we read from Ephesians 2. What a beautiful text. What a straightforward truth is found in verses 8 through 10 in terms of works and grace. The writers of the confession noted approximately 85 different passages. So there are many passages we could look to, this being just one of them. But I think an excellent summary of this precious doctrine. How can a believer then who is troubled by sin, how can a believer who is filled with many imperfections, many failures, do anything that a holy God would consider good? What's the answer to that question? The answer is found in verse 10 of Ephesians 2 and in other similar passages. The answer is that a believer enjoys union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the words again of verse 10. We have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is the heart of what we will consider this morning. The doctrine, the important doctrine of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ, that being the only basis for good works, that being the only basis for doing anything that God would say is pleasing to him. Now, there's a lot in the confession on this subject. We're not going to explore all the details, but let me begin with a few summary points, and then this will be our focus. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. But few, a few, excuse me, first a few introductory points on good works. Consider following four points. First, good works can only be defined as those activities commanded by God rather than imagined by man. And I think you know of crazy ideas that people think, oh, this is something good. It's not commanded by the Lord. It's just their own imagination. They do it to gain attention. You see these things in the church and in other places. What is good is that which is clearly defined by God, not that which you imagine As being good. Second, God commands the believer to demonstrate good works, we can say, for a number of reasons. Scripture gives commands that we demonstrate good works for a number of reasons, including this expressing our gratitude to God, confirming our faith, edifying others, showing God's grace to others, refuting our enemies, and then You might say, ultimately bringing glory to God. So a number of reasons why God commands believers to demonstrate good works. We've looked at this passage a number of times, but consider Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. What an amazing call of that verse. Anything, whatever you would do, do it heartily to the Lord, not to men. Then verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Third, it is absolutely impossible that a believer could do more than what God has required. This idea that you could do works beyond what God would expect is absolutely ridiculous. Because what does Scripture say? When you've done everything you are called to do, what are you? We are unprofitable servants at best. Right? That's the words of our Lord. We are unprofitable servants. That's not to beat us down, but it's so that we always remember who we are. And so it would be a mysterious or excuse me, a serious mistake to think that God has a standard similar to ours. Because we always accept less than perfection all the time. I mean, we're we're never perfect. So as humans, we always naturally expect and accept less than perfection. But to think God does that, to think God acts like I act or thinks like I think is an incredible mistake mistake. And so the idea that a saint could do more than expected, that those works could somehow pay the sins or be used to help pay the sins of others is so ridiculous. And again, those who think, well, as long as I do more good deeds than bad deeds, I'm going to be fine. It would be like you meet someone who 
is piling up rocks and they say, I'm going to reach the moon. I'm going to put all of these rocks up in a pile. Eventually, I'm going to reach the moon. I say, that person is a fool. And yet, as we speak of this metaphor, look at all the piles of rocks built up by men who think somehow they are going to ascend to heaven. So fourth, the good works of a believer are solely the result of God's work. The good works of a believer are solely the result of God's work. The work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we see from Ephesians 2, we are the workmanship of the Father. We have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. The Father has prepared these works beforehand. And we walk in these works through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's consider now, secondly, in greater detail, verse 10 of Ephesians 2. And if you have your scriptures open, just consider briefly how verse 10 is a conclusion. You note that verse 10 begins with the word for. So Paul, in in verse 10, is making a point of conclusion, a, a final point of proof. And you see how the opening verses of Ephesians 2 focus on our true nature as sinners, as rebels. And then verse 4 starts with, But God, who is rich and mercy. And so notice so clearly, where is the focus of this passage? It's giving all the glory to God. The focus entirely on the power, grace, and mercy of God. There's nothing about what man has done. There is, in verse 10, what man is called to do. We also observe this. God's work of grace is beyond our full comprehension in this life. But the work of God is beyond our full appreciation and consideration in this life. And that is a wonderful thing. We often sing Amazing Grace, don't we? We love that song, so familiar, probably every Christian can sing at least a verse of Amazing Grace. How often, though, do you ponder and rejoice in Amazing Grace? And Paul reminds us, no believer will fully grasp the amazing nature of God's grace in this life. And that is part of the glory of the ages to come. It is going to take eternity to explore this subject. Verse 10 states that believers are God's workmanship. And I think that translation, workmanship, is intentional because of the previous verse, verse 9, not of works, but rather we are God's workmanship. And workmanship is a good translation. That word in Greek is used only one other time in the New Testament. We go to Romans one twenty. You don't need to turn there. I trust that's a familiar verse, Romans one twenty, which says, The invisible attributes of God are clearly seen, how? By what he has made. And that's that same word, workmanship. And that's an amazing connection, isn't it? A connection that you find throughout the New Testament. The connection between God's work of creation and his work of redemption. God made the world without any help from you or me. And we are to think the same way in terms of his work of regeneration. You are the Father's work. We are his Creation, his physical creation, certainly, but then also his spiritual creation. Then we also look at the phrase created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the key phrase that I hope you will remember, especially from today. Created in Christ Jesus. Four times, if my count is correct, four times in Ephesians you have the verb create. Three of those times, the verb is actually related not to physical creation, but to regeneration, to a spiritual creation. The language of created in Christ Jesus, that language of in Christ speaks of what? Again, it's reference to this great doctrine of our union with God through Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the believer's union with Christ. Everything that you enjoy, 
in terms of salvation, in terms of blessings, is found where? It's found alone in Christ. And as I quickly scanned the book of Ephesians this week, I tried to note every passage that had reference to this doctrine of our union with Christ. And I may have missed passages, but I found probably 20 references just in Ephesians alone, just in six chapters of the book of Ephesians to our union with Christ. Let me just share a few of those references. We turn to the beginning. You can follow along if you would like. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll look at verses 3 and 4. Maybe you even want to underline or highlight in your Bible these references. Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So every blessing is found where? In Christ alone. Then verse 10 and 11. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him, excuse me, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Chapter 2. Even when we were dead in trespasses, this is verse 5, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Turning to chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 16 and 17, this is part of Paul's prayer for the believers in Ephesus. He is praying that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit. In the inner man, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. And the passage obviously continues there. Ephesians 4, 15. Ephesians 4, 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So there is union with Christ. There's also this growth and maturity of the believer and the church as a whole in Christ. And then Ephesians 6.10. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So many passages that speak of the believer's union and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the heart, not only in terms of our justification and sanctification, but then it's the heart of the good works that we would do. And so based on Ephesians 2.10 and other passages, we can say this. First, there is nothing naturally good in you. Nothing naturally good in you. So it's not a little bit of potential that the Lord uses for him. No, absolutely nothing naturally good in man. So that God's work of salvation is not improved behavior. It's not slightly changed behavior. No, God's work of salvation is what? The creation of an entirely new nature. The creation of an entirely new nature enjoyed in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the greatness of what God has done. Not reforming us as sinners. No, entirely creating something new. Now we recognize we also still have that old man. That old nature has not been decisively put to death or cut off, at least in terms of our own walk. And so anything good in us, it's not in us naturally. And so the only good you can ever do is in Christ. The only good you can do is that which God has prepared beforehand for you to do. Look at that last part of verse 10. So we are God's work. We are created in Christ. And then further, anything good that we do has been prepared beforehand. 
And that word in Greek is translated as prepared beforehand. Is, again, is only used one other time in the New Testament, used in Romans 9.23. You may remember that passage, Romans 9.23, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Here's what we can say, and we know this makes sense. There is the predestination of believers as well as the predestination of the good works that believers do. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Now, we know it makes sense. This is probably not the first time that we have thought of these things, but it's good to think that way. So just as there is no room for human achievement, there is great incentive for good works. There's absolutely nothing for which you can boast And yet there is an abundance for what you are called to do. Think of John 15, if you want to turn there. Before we come to the Lord's table, we're going to again reflect on John 15. This language of our union with Christ. Here, verses 5 and 8 that I will have as our focus now. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Then verse 8, by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Absolutely nothing for which you can boast. And yet an abundance for what you are called to do. My father is glorified when you bear much fruit fruit. And yet without me, you can do absolutely nothing. A. Hodge, in his commentary on the subject, stated this, in the time of the gospel, the gracious work of the believer and the gracious reward he receives from God are branches from the same gracious root. The same covenant of grace provides at once for the infusion of grace in the heart the exercise of grace in the life, and the reward of the grace so exercised. It is all of grace. A grace called reward added to a grace called work. And Ahaj is not talking about our justification. He's not talking about God rewards your work. He's talking about here the Christian life, the good works that we do. Well, consider a few points then of application and summary now. The first thing is this, recognize in your life, as I hope you do regularly, recognize how many of your good works, the best things that you do, are still marred by weakness and imperfection. Think carefully about how many good things you do, and yet you know you're not doing it for the right motive. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for attention. You're doing it perhaps for other reasons. And again, because of our sinful natures, we have naturally the wrong motives, the wrong goals for so much of what we do. Why why is it so important to be aware of this? Again, so that we never boast. Because that is the most natural thing for you to do, is to boast about all the good things that I have done. And yet we know there's absolutely no place for boasting in the Christian life. Zero So consider, again, how even your very best is marred by sin so that you will always be humble before the Lord. Second, rejoice that just as you have been accepted by God in Christ, the same thing is true of good works. Just as our persons, we are accepted how? We are accepted in Christ. The same thing is true of our good works. They are only accepted as they are done in Christ. The confession here states so beautifully, but that he, that is the Father, looking upon them in his Son, is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, although accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. The only good that you do that is accepted is that which is done in Christ. 
And so, yes, the Father does accept our works, but only because he looks upon them in his Son. That should be of wonderful encouragement. Third, it means if you are seeking to increase in good works, you must use the means that God gives. The believer is to grow in good works. The problem is we often use means that are man-centered. And so it's not self-help efforts. It's not making lists, making schedules, reading books on productivity and the like. That's not going to make you a more faithful disciple. Maybe you're going to learn some tips. They might be useful in some ways. It's not self-help efforts that will make you grow. Where is the strength? It's the strength that is found in Christ alone. Listen to a, a few passages, part of the prayer that we read earlier from Paul in Ephesians three sixteen and 17. What is Paul's prayer? He would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. And again, the passage continues. The command of Paul is be strong where? In the Lord, in the power of his might. My friends, are you seeking the strength that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ? That's where the strength to obey, the strength to do good works, that's where it comes from. The means of grace that God has given. Seek those things. Are you frequently humbled before the Lord? Do you recognize frequently your own helplessness, your own sin, and you cry to him? You know you are weak, but you rejoice in his promises to strengthen. That's, my friends, that is where you grow in terms of good works. It's the strengthening that comes through Christ by his spirit in the inner man. That needs to be your focus. Fourth, the ministry of the Holy Spirit cannot be ignored. In all of this, Paul speaks of it there in Ephesians 3. It's referenced in other places. It is in Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you bring honor to the Father. That's the beautiful pattern of the triune God in terms of our works. G.I. Williamson correctly states this. Just how the Spirit accomplishes this work is a mystery. It's a mystery. We know it's through the Spirit, but how that works out in terms of all the details, that is a mystery. And he says, we do not pretend to know how the Spirit does this work. We only know that God's Word requires us to acknowledge that He does it so that we will praise the Spirit for everything good that we are able to do, and He does it by means of the truth. So there are things we do not fully understand. You cannot understand all the ways that God works You don't have to. Your focus must be on what has been revealed. Your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Your focus on the call of God's word. It reminds us anything and only through the spirit can be accomplished. And yet, if we just think, oh, we're just going to let the spirit move us, that would be to make a mistake. That would be to use excuses. Hebrews 6.12 says, Do not become sluggish. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Jude 20 says this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So look to Christ. Use the means that he graciously gives to you. One of those means being the Lord's Supper. I mentioned four points in summary and application. Your own sinfulness, your acceptance in Christ, the strength that is found in Christ, the working of the Holy Spirit. And and these four points are so beautifully found in the Lord's Supper, aren't they? Because as we enjoy this meal, we should be reminded of our own sinfulness our own weakness, our own imperfection. That is why Christ was given for you. We should be reminded then of our acceptance in Christ. Our acceptance because he took your place. 
You should be reminded of the strength found in Christ. He offers you himself. He gives bread and wine to remind you his strength is your strength. From his body, he does strengthen us, not in a mechanical, not in a physical way, but through the working of the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord's Supper beautifully sets the pattern for our dependence. The only way you will do anything good through the terms that God has set forth. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Think and meditate on that. Pray for the strength that comes in Christ alone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this brief meditation. And as we continue now our worship in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, let us celebrate again as your word sets forth. We come to this table, not because we have earned this, but because of your grace. And yet we do not want to come in a way that makes a mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not want to make a mockery of what this meal represents. And so work in the life of this congregation, in our church, we do pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.